My name is Keisha. Hi, I'm Syriac. And this is our fur baby Zumi. And today we're going to be talking about sort of like the, the history of massage noir. Just it was inspired by um, watching the Janet Jackson documentary that just came out on Lifetime and in collaboration with A and E, and that really had me going down the rabbit hole of of all the stuff that I've experienced and seen about, you know, just how black women are treated in American society, as well as what I have learned that happens to black women all over the world. So, so we want to have a radically blending discussion about it and just kind of share our thoughts, our interpretation, maybe what we read and seen and share maybe some tips for those that want to really educate themselves and educate others on on how to like dismantle you know how that's in everyday conversations and behaviors of people when it comes to black women so uh the the definition of massage noir is it's an intersection between sexism and racism particularly of black women in visual culture as well as in digital spaces. That is how Moya Bailey uh, described it. She came up with it and it has went viral ever since. Really resonated with a lot of black women, including myself, on what we have experienced and what we have witnessed, um, you know, other black women experiencing. So with that being said, the first thing I wanted to talk about why, again, why I wanted to have this conversation was watching the Janet Jackson documentary. Um, you know, there was a lot of parts in there that of course was triggering to me, you know, being from the Midwest too, and being an empath and watching how she had shared her story, her, you know, kind of masking her feelings a lot of times and then sharing a little bit of how she felt. So just knowing that, just knowing how people and black women how we show our emotions, but we don't. So it was just watching her that really, uh, I, I caught a lot of what she was saying without saying it, if that makes sense to people. Um, but the biggest part of the documentary for me was the, the whole Super Bowl fiesta. Yeah. Um, in addition to watching the Jenna Jackson documentary, I watched the one from New York Times on Hulu about um, the wardrobe malfunction, Nipplegate, and how pretty much the industry that she works in, television, execs, parent council groups got together and really wanted to make Janet Jackson feel like crap for what she stated was a mistake, but they didn't want her to live that, live that down. So, uh, live that down. So, um, yeah, so what was your, what were your thoughts about the documentary? You only saw the Janet one, but. Yeah, I didn't see the New York Times one. Yeah. So, um, but the A&E, A&E? Yeah. Uh, the A&E uh, documentary, I mean, it was good for me because I didn't know that much about her life story. But the details, you know, I knew about the Jackson family. I knew that she was one of the babies of the family, um, but I never got to hear about her experiences. I think the stuff I knew about the Jackson family was probably more related to Michael. Um, yeah, so I, th I thought it was a, a really good, a good documentary series. Do you remember? Because I think we had just started dating um, when that happened. That was in '04. Do you remember like how everyone was reacting to what happened? At yeah, the Super Bowl? Yeah. Um, yeah, about? I remember it being controversial. Yeah. Or just it being in the news a lot. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I, I remember some of the, the scenes from the New York Times one because I think I was I fell asleep on the couch. So I <laughs> would wake up periodically and hear certain parts and just hearing, you know, people testifying in Congress. Yes. Right? Like, yes. Looking back, it doesn't seem like it was that big a deal to have congressional hearings about it. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, especially considering how kind of pervasive, just kind of sex, 
and particularly the object, ad, objectification of women is mm -hmm. it's not like you know nipplegate was the first time women's sexuality was on display in the super bowl i just think about commercials or you know beer commercials <laughs> of women in general for people to to get all up in arms about what happened in that way just doesn't seem to make a lot of sense again given you know sexualizing of women and girls in the media is seems to be pretty acceptable yeah. and yeah and I guess you know if if it had been like Britney Spears or somebody you know I wonder how different the conversation would have been Right. You know, the fact that it was a black woman and a black woman's body or sexuality that became like the focus. I'm sure that influenced the conversations that happened. Yeah. Or the reactions to it. Yeah, so it's funny you should bring up Britney Spears because then that leads me to the conversation about Justin Timberlake and how he was there. He he helped to have the wardrobe malfunction, even if he didn't mean to do that. His treatment was a lot. So... She at the time, uh, I, this was in the Hulu one. Um, she at the time was about to sign with Coca-Cola, like a really big, I think $50 million. And then she had signed with Virgin Records and he bought an island because of her record sales, whoever the dude is. Um, Justin Timberlake kept his endorsements. He got Grammys and did the apologizing to the, the CBS exec which Janet didn't want to do, which I don't blame her. She already apologized. He wanted, this exact wanted her to grovel. But anyway, Justin was able to keep his endorsements, have his record top 10, if not number one. And then he was also able to go to Grammys, get Grammys. She was asked not to go. And she didn't get any Grammys. And her album, The Me Joe, that just came out, did, did not even have the um, airplay that her other albums before that got to have. So that really had me like furious listening to that because they wanted to continue to punish her and put her to blame because money was involved too. Like they had to pay fines for that. Mm -hmm. But anyway, I, I just want to kind of share like those examples, those things that happened to her had me, of course, thinking about all the other times that black women have been treated, you know, below standard as far as if they make a mistake or if they celebrate their sexuality, if they have that platform to be like, you know, as big as she she is, she was, still is a lot of times, they are they are they're not treated the same as, as maybe a white counterpart. So Madonna, Madonna was doing a whole bunch of stuff to your point and she never got blackballed, so to speak. So, but some other examples that I think would be great to um, talk about, to, to hear your thoughts on examples in media. You ever watch Martin? Yeah. Yeah. Do you remember how like Gina and Pam, did you ever notice like a difference between how they were portrayed on that show and how Martin himself Treated Pam. What you need to do is go in the back and straighten out those buckshots in the back of your neck. <laughs> Girl, your hair is so nappy, Wilson couldn't pick it. And the, and the, the language. Yeah, thinking back. Yeah, I, I have general <laughs> recollection. Like, I have to go back and watch the episodes mm -hmm. to remember specific words he used. 
Yeah. Um, so let's go back to like, I want to talk about like all the different caricatures or in media it's called tropes, but like in everyday life, there's stereotypes. Do you know like the Sapphire and the, the Mammy? You want to talk about yeah. the Mammy? Who's the Mammy? Um, <laughs> I'm not quizzing you. I figure you know this stuff. Yeah, so, yeah, the, I guess the mammy stereotype is directly out of uh, ens enslavement of African Americans in the South and, you know, kind of the idealized vision of pl plantation life and, um, you know, the use of black women as kind of helpers, caretakers in, in the house, um, you know, kind of the mistress's main helper inside the house. Um, so a typical mammy character would be the, a cook, mm -hmm. uh, care for the master's children. Um, yeah, really kind of doing the domestic labor inside the house that a white woman or a white master, mistress, uh, whatever, would not do, but I guess would be kind of supervising. And in, in, I'm trying to think of Movies. film depictions. Obviously, Gone with the Wind. I'm trying to think if there was something before Gone with the Wind. I mean, they probably existed in in novels like mm. Uncle Tom's Cabin. Um, was it in Birth of a Nation? Like they have an image of a black woman. I, I don't know. I don't remember. remember. Um, the Help is after. Yeah, typically in at least in visual representation from Gone with the Wind, right? The Mammy was typically bigger bodied, unattractive, um, or cast as unattractive, right? Usually um, the white woman was fur or ideal for womanhood, mm -hmm. and the Mammy character was kind of the contrast to that. So asexual, uh, unattractive. Um, Not a threat yeah, to definitely. the white woman. You know, physically imposing, you know, in terms of, in that sense. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, yeah, so the help is one that sticks out. Sophia from The Color Purple, she was often thought to, to be depicted like, and the way people thought of Oprah at the time when she was really big, how she would take in all the white guests and comfort them and, you know, make them feel at home. And so she was often thought to be like a, a mammy uh, archetype. But the one, the one character that was often a thought to be a threat, Bell. the Jezebel is the one that mm. gave the, the thought to be making everyone desire her and if she was to be raped it's not even considered rape because she's overly sexual she's hypersexual mm -hmm. she um so when they would when they did start taking africans from you know parts of africa and brought them here to the americas to all over they would rape them and that wasn't even a crime it wasn't a big deal because oh they're hypersexual look at them they went to africa when the europeans went to africa they saw like their bodies um it's hot as hell, but they were like, why are they naked? Why are they dressed, you know, not with clothes on? So that was the assumption that, oh, they must like to have sex and we can do whatever with them because look at, they're barely dressed. Yeah, I don't know any specific characters. I definitely know it It fit very well into the, the power dynamics during the period of enslavement where, you know, it was kind of the custom for white men to have com total power and control over black women's bodies and, you know, where we know rape was, was used a lot. Um, and obviously, you know, a stereotype like, like a Jezebel who's sexually loose and kind of, yeah, always inviting sexual advances would make it impossible 
for a black woman to be raped, right? So anything that a white man or any sexual interaction between them, like you said, would have been kind of at her invitation, right? So there would be no, there'd be no way to transgress and cross a line in terms of sexual relationships with a black woman because, you know, according to the stereotype, they're always ready and inviting.